What is going on world? What's up YouTube? It's Zero here. Today I'm bringing you guys a brand new episode of the 8 Below Show. Welcome everyone to 8 Below. And guys, in today's episode, we have a ton of stuff to talk about. Really excited about it. So here's a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be getting into here today in this episode. We're going to be talking about Call of Duty Advanced Warfare and the possibilities of a sequel to Advanced Warfare and what the probability on that might be and where possibly is Advanced Warfare 2 at this point. We're also going to be talking about some movie stuff as in the form of Tenet, a new movie by Christopher Nolan that's going to be, of course, being released this upcoming summer. And then we're also going to be talking about Fred, the famous YouTuber and his whereabouts. And then we're going to end off the show with some StarCraft 3 stuff. So really excited about it, guys. We're going to get right into this thing. So guys, the first thing I want to talk about here today on the show is about Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. Now, I've been on record many times, guys, stating that the Jetpack era of Call of Duty was technically speaking in my eyes, the dark ages of COD. But that being said, there is a lot of, I've gotten a lot of people asking me, you know, the whereabouts of where an Advanced Warfare 2 might have been if that was something that was going to happen. Is it going to happen in the future? So where is Advanced Warfare 2? Because a lot of you already know that as far as the Jetpack games go, my favorite one by far out of all of those was Advanced Warfare because it was the first of the Jetpack games, so it was kind of fresh, it was new, and I really did uh, have fun with the game for a, about a month or so. I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was very long, but I did enjoy and I appreciated what they did with trying Advanced Warfare and Call of Duty. I'm just, of course, not happy that they continued it with Black Ops 3 into Infinite Warfare. But that being said, let's talk about Advanced Warfare 2 and where is the game at this point? And, you know, we'll talk about if we really think that Advanced Warfare 2 will be something that is made in the future. So let's talk about it. So an article that was written by Den of Geek and uh, was written by Matthew Bird. This was written a couple of years ago, guys. But that being said, I still found that this article was really well put together. Call of Duty World War II was supposed to be Advanced Warfare 2. Sledgehammer Games wanted to continue their futuristic take on the Call of Duty franchise. Activision has revealed that Sledgehammer Games originally intended to develop a sequel to Call of Duty Advanced Warfare instead of Call of Duty World War II. Sledgehammer wanted to make AW2, said Activision CEO Eric Hirschberg, during an interview with Newsweek. While they seemed rather committed to that plan, some within Activision recognized that there was a rather large portion of the franchise's fan base that deeply wished the publisher would push the game back towards its World War II roots. Once they realized that they'd like to go that direction, Hirschberg stated that those at Activision had little doubt that Sledgehammer could handle the change of plans. We knew they would become historians, that they would tackle it with authenticity, give a tremendous care, and we also knew they would capture the unspeakable scale of World War II. Now, before we even move onwards, you know, uh, where he states that a large portion of the franchise's fan base wanted to go back to the roots of World War II, I don't know if that was necessarily true, that a huge portion, a large portion of the fan base, I think people did want to go back to World War II, but I think really what we wanted was boots on the ground. That's what the fan base wanted, was a boots on the ground Call of Duty uh, that would go back to, you know, those roots, just boots on the ground, fighting on battlefields and, and, and things of that nature, not jumping like 20 feet in the air and, you know, using jetpacks and advanced movement. But, um, uh, you know, World War II, of course, I mean, you know, certainly was a good starting point as far as getting us out of those dark ages, uh, without a doubt. Of course, the team at Sledgehammer couldn't do it alone. When it came to actually delivering authentic World War II experience, Activision wanted to ensure that the developers had all the resources they would need. They even brought in an actual World War II historian named Martin Morgan, who took the developers to key locations of World War II in the hopes that they would later be able to accurately render them and understand their full significance. Activision also contacted World War II veterans and had them talk to the team. So, 
you know, one thing I, I do think that they really did do their homework. Activision and Sledgehammer did a lot of homework on this World War II game, even though a lot of people didn't like World War II. Uh, I really appreciated the campaign. I thought the campaign was very well done, uh, and you can tell that they did a lot of their research on the campaign, at least. The, you know, as far as the multiplayer side and, you know, all of that, I mean, you know, it was an okay experience. I didn't think it was great. It was one of those games I didn't play a ton of either, but uh, I thought that I really appreciated they went back to boots on the ground, and I really appreciated just how much they put into this game. You could just tell uh, in the production quality and, and value and such. So we think it's daunting to show our games to our fans, and here we were showing it to people who actually stormed the beaches in Normandy, who actually fought through uh, the Hurchton Forest, and we're showing them those levels from the game. It was an incredibly gratifying experience. After the lights came up, these gentlemen looked at us and said, yep, you got it right. It was one of those human moments where something you're making for entertainment purposes intersects with real life in a pretty impactful way. As for whether or not Sledgehammer will ever expand the Infinite Warfare line as they originally intended to, that's a matter what that remains up for debate. However, considering that World War II is selling quite well, you probably shouldn't expect any sci-fi adventures in the near future. Sure. So, this is going to lead me to the next couple of things here with this, guys. Uh, number one is that, okay, so World War II comes out, and it was pretty successful, relatively successful. It, was, it sold well, was the number one best-selling game that year, which every Call of Duty basically is. It doesn't even matter what comes out, but um, it's always the best-selling game because that's just the, the, the brand that is Call of Duty. Now, Call of Duty went from those Dark Ages, Advanced Warfare, even though Advanced Warfare kind of started it, I felt that it was still like kind of refreshing, right? Um, it was kind of something different, and that's what a lot of people wanted. They just wanted something different, and so they went they went different. But the problem was that they did they greenlit three of those types of games instead of just one, just tried it. I, that's what I think they should have done was just try it, go back to the, the roots once again. But they did three games, and, you know, it is what it is. It's in the history books now. But World War II uh, sold relatively well, right? It sold well. And then, of course, you know, we got Black Ops 4, which I thought was absolutely a great game. Only thing that, w for me, that bothered me about Black Ops 4 was that there was no campaign. And I'm, I'm a campaign guy. I love playing the campaign modes. But the multiplayer was fantastic. And then, of course, we got, you know, to where we are now with Modern Warfare, which is, you know, kind of another step in the right direction. Boots on the ground. Really exciting. Really, um, you know, Call of Duty's kind of 100% back, as I've said in the past. It's, it is definitely back to what made COD great, and hopefully they can continue this. Now, Sledgehammer Games, for those of you who don't know, obviously uh, is not really like a standalone studio anymore. They're, they are now working with, um, they're now working with Treyarch, and so, and as well as Raven Software, they're all working together on the next Black Ops title, uh, you know, up, apparently is what's happening now. So they aren't doing their own game anymore. So it went from three different studios, Infinity Ward, Treyarch and Sledgehammer Games to now two, which is in the form of Treyarch and Infinity Ward. So, obviously, in my eyes, I don't see an Advanced Warfare 2 coming. So where is this game at this point? Well, it was supposed to be World War II. And, wow, would that have been... Uh, I don't know where we would be now. If, if Activision decided... To go through with Advanced Warfare 2 instead of World War 2, I think there would be some significant problems with the Call of Duty uh, franchise. It may have sold really well once again, uh, but I highly doubt it. Highly doubt it. And I think that Sledgehammer games, they probably, it sounds like they would like to go back to Advanced Warfare once again, which, you know, look, guys, like I said, the multiplayer was was kind of, it was just refreshing, it was different, right? But it felt like Halo, it felt like Titanfall, it didn't feel like Call of Duty. The campaign was fun, but it was kind of like a standalone game. It was, there was never really any thought like, oh yeah, this is going to get a sequel, kind of like Ghosts. Ghosts felt like it was going to get a sequel because of how it ended, as far as the campaign's concerned. Advanced Warfare really didn't end like that. It didn't end any particular way where it was like, oh yeah, this is definitely going to deserve a sequel. But that being said, Activision, we don't know what the future holds as far as the Call of Duty brand and, and franchise is concerned. I think that they know what they did right, what they did wrong, and what they can do better moving forward, hearing you know from the fan base and, and all of that. 
And I think now, instead of making it a three-year cycle, a two-year cycle, or, you know, my personally, what I, I, I personally feel is going to happen is they made Modern Warfare as a reboot. They're going to do Black Ops, the same exact thing, kind of like a reboot almost of each of them. And from each year moving forward after Black Ops, Call of Duty Black Ops gets announced next year, I think that they're just going to alternate each year on Modern Warfare and Black Ops because they're the two most, you know, two most recognized brands within Call of Duty. And, or I guess you could say, you know, sub-genres in Call of Duty. And... What I do think, though, that's going to happen is is that they're just going to add on to Modern Warfare or add on to Black Ops each year. I, I don't think that they're going to make like another, you know, Modern Warfare 2 or, you know, Modern Warfare 4 or Modern Warfare 5, wherever we're at, uh, another, you know, Black Ops 5 or something. I think they're just, they're going to go back and forth, but they're just going to add DLC. They're going to be adding things to each of those games. I might be wrong, but I feel like that's the direction that they may be going in now. However, we might be wrong, and maybe we will see Advanced Warfare 2, but I think it would be a pretty far ways off because Sledgehammer Games is now, you know, with Treyarch, and I think Treyarch is more focused on Black Ops than they would be on going into, like, Advanced Warfare because they would probably just do a Black Ops game that would be semi— that would be futuristic like Advanced Warfare had the advanced movement system. They already did it with Black Ops 3. So I would have to say, personally, that Advanced Warfare 2— I don't think that it's going to come out anytime soon if it ever comes out. I, I think that there's a better chance that we see like a Call of Duty Ghost 2 come out from Infinity Ward, but even at that, I think is a stretch because they're so focused on the Modern Warfare sub-franchise within the entirety of Call of Duty. But I, I might be wrong, and you know, um, I think it would be interesting to, you know, it would have been interesting to see kind of what they were thinking with Advanced Warfare 2. Would it be, of course, probably the Advanced Movie System most likely is what they would do. But maybe, you know, something in Advanced Warfare 2 might be good in like another 10 years or something. Like they want to try, you know, the Advanced Movie System once again at some point when like new technologies come out and such. Um, you know, just because maybe in 10 years, the, the boots on the ground feel of Call of Duty won't be, you know, it'll feel like, hey, we want it, we want to change. We want something that's going to be, you know, kind of fast and, and you, you like unrealistic. We might want that in, you know, another 10 years. I don't think it's right now. And I definitely don't think it's a good idea that that happens right now. I think it needs to be, you know, years down the road that we get another jetpack Call of Duty. If we ever get another jetpack Call of Duty, because in my opinion, a jetpack Call of Duty is not Call of Duty. It's just, you know, kind of a carbon copy of like a Titanfall meets Halo. Um, and that was just kind of my personal opinion on it. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Would you guys like to see Advanced Warfare 2? And you guys think we will ever see one in the future? Let me know. So Tenet, guys, a movie in which is probably at the very top of my list for 2020 movies that I'm the most anticipated for. This is a movie that, coming from Christopher Nolan, who I believe is one of the, the best visionaries in filmmaking right now, and uh, this guy is starting to make a case for best director on the planet when it comes to filmmaking, which we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the show. But right now, talking about Tenet, everything that we know so far about uh, about this movie, I want to kind of talk about it. We can break down some things. Of course, the new trailers uh, did release, and we were able to like see some, you know, some footage. But a lot of it, of course, has to do with time. It seems, which is something that Christopher Nolan really likes to kind of deal with with within his movies. But we still don't really know much at all, and that's why Christopher Nolan is so good at, at doing everything from from his visuals to the trailers he puts out and releases to, to the public, and then the movies themselves are, generally speaking, very, very good and like, very psychological and very thrilling as well. So in this article, it was written a little, uh, a little while ago, about five months ago. Um, but nonetheless, I thought that this was a really good article written. As it states, Christopher Nolan hasn't really done a sequel outside of the Batman trilogy that sought to reinvent the Dark Knight in some way. But some are starting up the theory that Tenet could be related in a big way to the movie Inception, though at this point it's more of a rumor and not much else. We know the lineup that's going to be used for the movie and a few basic ideas that have been teased, but other than this, there's not a lot that's been handed down that we can really use to e extrapolate any further details. What does seem obvious, though, is that it's getting many people, including Ryan Scott from MovieWeb and several others, kind of excited 
to think of what might be on the way in 2020. So far, it looks as though the coming year will be a big one for the movie theaters and a great time for a lot of audience members since a great deal of material is coming out. And it's bound to herald another wave of change when it comes to the movies. It might not be such a big thing. It might not even be as big of a change as anyone is thinking. But one thing is clear, and that's the fact that there's a good deal to anticipate when 2020 arrives. So, Tenet, guys, obviously coming out this summer... Something, you know, Christopher Nolan, it's interesting that he releases his movies in the summer. I know that he loves doing the big blockbusters that come out in the summer. But at the same time, I feel like all of his movies are so good that they should all be nominated, essentially. Like, most of his movies that he's come out with should have been nominated. I feel like Dunkirk actually was one of the movies that was not that impressive to me. Uh, I, I, I just, I don't know why. I think there was a number of reasons why I didn't think uh, Dunkirk was that great. I thought that the, the visuals were great, but I just thought that they kind of held back because it was a PG-13 rating. Nonetheless, that got nominated, and I felt like some of his other movies that didn't get nominated should have been nominated without a doubt. And Tenet, I'm wondering if it's going to be kind of more of the same because even though it might be an absolutely mind-blowing type of movie, it seems like the movies that are that come out in the summer a lot of times aren't nominated because usually you got the you know the Oscar season which is later on in the year. But nonetheless, Christopher Nolan maybe he just doesn't care about that. He just wants to make really great movies that are you know big and grand. And so I mean, it's hard to tell. But that being said, I think Tenet definitely, you know, people are, are are comparing this movie to Inception, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Another little factoid, courtesy of Ali Jemel from Collider, is that this movie is going to focus in international espionage, so likening it to Inception might be even easier since the whole point of Inception was that Hobbes and his team were adept at finding their way into a person's mind to obtain secrets and would then use whatever they found to complete the heist. If this is the same, which it might be according to many that have seen the trailer, we could be in for another thrill ride thanks to Nolan and his genius. To be honest, it would be nice to see this kind of movie again since it did so well the first time, but with the new crew, it's bound to be quite different since whether or not it's like Inception, it will still have a different storyline to follow and something that will keep people in their seat and watching until the credits start to roll. One thing that's obvious is that Christopher Nolan has never really let us down when it comes to entertainment, but he does like to keep things close to the vest at times. And that is an understatement. Uh, he keeps things very close to the vest. Uh, you know, he doesn't even really, you know, allow pictures getting out from his sets and such. So it, without a doubt, this is going to be something that uh, another one of those movies that I feel is going to be absolutely mind bending and very exciting. Because my question is, is that sure Inception? It seems like you know it'd be the easiest way to like compare this to Inception. But I'm also going to throw out Interstellar because Interstellar ended on a cliffhanger, if you don't remember. It ended on a cliffhanger, and when we're talking about different dimensions and things of that nature, this is something that could definitely be in that, kind of like in that universe as well, which of course we'll have to kind of wait and see. But Inception is definitely, uh, you know, I know a lot of people would love it to be, you know, a sequel to Inception. I would like it to be a sequel. I mean, or I'd like it to just to be its own thing. That's the other thing that I would... Uh, I'd be I'd be happy with that as well. It would appear that Michael Caine will be making his way back into Nolan's circle as he's been there with Nolan for several movies and seems to be one of the director's favorite actors. Many directors tend to have a running stable of talent that they like to work with from time to time and some that they simply have to have in their movies more often than not. This is easy to notice when you start to watch more and more of their movies since the rapport that is developed between actors and the director tends to show in the manner of how many movies they work on together and sometimes in how effective the actors are at taking direction from the same person over and over again. While it's not really certain what Kane's role will be in the movie as of yet, it's usually a good sign to see him around since there's going to be a good part of entertainment that is attributable solely to his acting. 
Thankfully, there are other noted actors that will be showing up, such as John David Washington, Robert Pattinson, Elizabeth Debicki, Kenneth Branagh, and a few others that will give the story a, a bit of pep since they've been noted as being able to perform and perform well in previous projects. So far, the movie seems like it might be one of the more stipulating going into 2020. And while there are many movies coming out that could make such a bold claim, they don't have Nolan at the helm, which is a uh, big up for Tenet to begin with. So uh, I think that that's true. I think that certainly the noted actors, John David Washington and Robert Pattinson, even though I'm not a huge Robert Pattinson fan, um, but you know, definitely John David Washington, I'm very, I'm very intrigued to see him as the, as the star in this, in this film. And, you know, um, as far as other 2020 movies that are coming out, I think that there's going to, I think there's going to be some stiff competition though. I mean, Dune is a movie that's going to be coming out, uh, of course with Denny Villeneuve or well, I, I'm not even sure exactly how to say his name, but he is a great director as well, and Dune is a movie I think that's going to do well as well, and that, that's a movie that's going to be slated, I believe, in December, so it's going to be more around the Oscar season. So I think that Tenet is going to be, it's going to have some stiff competition, but I still think that Christopher Nolan is, um, without a doubt, the, the, the one of the strongest directors in the entire world at this point. He's made a case that he is the best director on the planet. And that's saying something for, you know, of course, his age, how many movies he's made and things of that nature. But that being said, I, I think we're all pretty excited about, about this movie. But the idea that it has anything to do with Inception or could be like it in any way is going to be the reason why some people give it any attention since Inception was such a mind-bending movie unto itself that people are still debating to this day whether or not the ending was fashioned in the way that they think it was. If Tenet is even half as good as Inception was, then there's a great chance that it could pull down roughly the same numbers, if not better, depending on how the story is fashioned and whether or not it gets people thinking in several different directions at once. In any case, it will be fun to find out. So there's something about Christopher Nolan Having his name attached to a project is similar to me, at least, like having Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, you know, uh, tied to a project. You know, anytime that you put on the screen a film by Christopher Nolan or you see Leonardo DiCaprio's name up there, those are big names that are going to draw a crowd. Regardless of how good the movie is, they're, they're, they, they have such a, a strong following of people, like a cult following of people that want to go watch their movie regardless of really what it is just because they're intrigued i think christopher nolan has earned that without a doubt and so i do think that tenant could certainly do as you know it could do very well um you know do kind of the numbers of maybe interstellar possibly inception but i think inception had so many strong names in that movie um and, and dicaprio was there of course at the helm of that movie I have a hard time believing that Tenet will be even bigger than that, but maybe the following has just grown and grown even more for Christopher Nolan. And so now maybe it's just uh, that maybe this movie is going to be absolutely huge because apparently the the production budget for this movie is very, very big. Um, so that's going to be something that's going to be interesting to say the least. But that's everything that we know so far, guys, about this movie, Tenet, I mean, it's, you know, from the trailers and such, very mind-bendy, everything has to deal with time, so that's why I'm wondering, you know, is this part of Interstellar, is this a part of, you know, Inception, or is it something completely on its own? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, what do you guys think about the trailers that have been released so far, what's your favorite Christopher Nolan movie, let me know what you guys think. So, is Tenet, a sequel to Inception or Interstellar, or is it a movie that is completely on its own? Just another movie that Christopher Nolan creates that is, you know, just kind of within its, it, it could be, it's just completely and 100% its own thing. Let's talk about that. Because I got my own theory on it, guys. Uh, you know, Inception one of the best movies ever made, in my opinion. One of my favorite movies. And Interstellar one of, another one of my favorite movies ever made. I mean, they're, they're both so good in their own right. And I, I do think that Interstellar is the best space movie that I've ever seen. It was just absolutely, uh, incredibly put together. And Inception, even though 
Inception, you know, kind of ended on somewhat of a cliffhanger. It wasn't even, you know, even close to the cliffhanger that was left that was left to us in Interstellar. So many people are jumping on this notion that Tenet could be a sequel to Inception. And guys, I would be completely cool with an Inception sequel in the form of Tenet. Believe me, I think that would be absolutely awesome. I would I would love that idea. I, th- I think it's a great idea. I also kind of like the idea though, even though I, I love the idea of, of this being a, a sequel to one of his movies, I also would kind of like the idea of Tenet maybe just being its own thing. But at the same time, I think, you know, when I when I look at a movie like uh, M. Night Shyamalan, who does, he's done a number of different, more along the lines of horror movies, but some thrillers, you know, I, I really liked, you know, uh, his, his movie Unstoppable that came out, um, or Unbreakable. When that came out, you know, it was a great movie. And then, of course, you know, years later, he comes out with a sequel to it. Uh, and, you know, I I thought that that was really neat that he did that, you know, years later coming out with a sequel, um, for the movie and people didn't even know people had no idea that this was a sequel to one of, uh, one of M night Shyamalan's earlier movies. And it just added a lot of buzz and it got a lot of excitement. And, you know, then they, of course they finished off like a trilogy for it with, with glass, but this is a movie, and Christopher Nolan's a guy who, it doesn't really seem like he's one of those guys who really wants to stick much with like a, a speci- one specific franchise. He just likes to make individual movies that are talked about for years and years. And in my opinion, Tenet, if it is a part of a sequel to either one like Interstellar or Inception, I would have to go with Interstellar because of the way Interstellar ended. I thought that the ending of Interstellar was so, oh yeah, there has to be a sequel to this. You know, basically there's, you know, she, uh, uh, what was her name? <laughs> I forget her character name in it. But anyway, they're talking about, uh, or Matthew McConaughey's daughter in the movie um, was at the very end, had like a voiceover where she's talking about how, she is on another, there's a, you know, she's out there somewhere, you know, getting ready for the long nap. And they give you the impression that Matthew McConaughey gets in the, into, you know, the, um, gets into the ship and he's going to head out there to go find her. And so it was a significant cliffhanger. It has everything to do with time and and all of that because of, you know, when you're on one planet, you know, an hour on one planet is like 10 years here on Earth. And so there was just a lot of like the time, you know, and and different dimensions and and things of that nature that really came into Interstellar. That's why I think that there's a better chance that it is a sequel of Interstellar than Inception. And I'm not saying that, look. I'm not saying Interstellar is better than Inception. I'd like both these movies about equally. And I I would love to explore more in both of those worlds, right? I really would. I'd like to explore more Interstellar because seeing more planets and, 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 you know, kind of just seeing where it kind of goes. And then Inception, the same exact thing. You know, what happens to Hobbes? You know, what, what, you know... Does, does he come, does he, is he actually back in reality or is it, you know, is he still within the dream? Those are all big questions because you could really go any way you wanted. But part of me, guys, part of me actually just wants Tenet to be its own thing. Because that's what has made Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan is, you know, you just make these movies and some of them are cliffhangers, some of them aren't, but some of them are cliffhangers and there's a like an okay element to that where it's it's just look like we want you I, I'm I gave you this movie. It's up to you to interpret how it ends and, and all of those things because he doesn't give answers. He doesn't tell you what happens. Uh, and that's what makes Christopher Nolan such a great director. He creates these incredible stories. and sometimes he leaves them on these cliffhangers, sometimes he doesn't. I mean, like let's even go back to, 
The Dark Knight Rises. The cliffhanger that was left off there. You know, Batman's done. Robin's taken the helm. And, and, and you know, and that completely opened up the DCU, uh, or the DCEU, for Warner Brothers. And of course they messed it up. Of course they did. I'm not going to get on a significant rant here. But, but the idea, though, guys, is that he kind of left that on a cliffhanger. It was like, oh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt Joseph Gordon is Robin. Let's go. Like, you know, this is going to be awesome to see, like, where they go with this. Is Christopher Nolan going to continue it? And he did it. He didn't continue it. And he just did his own thing. It seemed like he didn't want to be a part of, you know, be involved with any more, like, superheroes or, like, you know, franchises like that. He just wanted to do his own original stuff. And after those Batman movies, he was able to do whatever the heck he's wanted to, and every single one of his movies that's come out has been successful. I don't know, guys. I don't know. I A part of me says that this is going to be absolutely incredible. In Incredible. I think Tenet is going to be something that we're going to talk about once again for a long time. Like we've talked about Interstellar for a long time. We talked about Inception for a long time. I think Tenet is another one of those that we're just going to talk about for years to come after we see it. We're going to want to see it multiple times. And uh, I, I think there's going to be real replay value there. And I think Christopher Nolan's going to hit it, hit it out of the park again. But I wouldn't be surprised if this is a movie that is more polarizing whereas there's kind of people are on one side or the uh, one side of the fence or another because we're, we live in a time where it seems since one of these types of movies have come out from Christopher Nolan it, it seems to me that everyone's so divided on everything everything in society it's it's divided right like everyone has a side, everyone wants to have a voice or wants to be heard or, um, you know, has their own opinions. I mean, we can see it from just the Rise of Skywalker, the newest Star Wars movie, where it was so divided on, you know, some people loved it, some people just hated it, you know, and, and there wasn't really much in between. Some people, you know, it, it just seemed like everyone was on one side, one extreme or another. Tenet, I think, might be Christopher Nolan's first movie that is very divided. It's very divisive on what people think, especially if this is a sequel to one of those movies, Interstellar or Inception. Part of me thinks that it's going to be a, a sequel. Part of me thinks it's just going to be a standalone movie. But I would love to hear from you all. Do you think that Tenet is a sequel to Interstellar or Inception, or do you think it's going to be a sequel to one of his other movies in the past, or do you think it is just a movie, a standalone movie, all on its own? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, and let's have a real conversation about it. So Christopher Nolan, guys, one of those directors that has been incredibly influential to myself as well as just so many other people out there, and he has really, in my opinion... He's a director that it's almost like any movie that he brings out. No matter how good or bad you think it's going to be, you still go just to see what it's all about. Because he doesn't bring out a movie every year. He usually has a few years in between each of his movies. So you just know that it's not like he's you know pumping out movie after movie. Some of them are hits and some of them are misses. No, he pretty much is always bringing out an absolute and utter hit or something that we all really do enjoy. I'm going to give you guys a couple of reasons why I think that Christopher Nolan is making a real case for greatest director of all time. And it's not because of the sheer amount of stuff that he's made, but it's the things that in movies that he's made that he's done such a good job on and the movies that are just absolutely so incredibly well done that I think that he is starting to make a case for himself that if he's not, you know, at least in the conversation of greatest director all time, he is at least the greatest director or in the conversation for greatest director currently as of right now. So let's talk about that. So guys, I think it's important that we look at all the movies that he has directed up to this point. 
So you look at it in 1998, you got Following, which if you haven't seen any of one of these movies, I would recommend seeing all of them, guys, because these are all very well done. Every one of his movies has some type of psychological meaning or some some, some sort of like psychological thrill. Uh, he loves these types of films, and you know it's just one of those things, guys, where I would certainly recommend watching all of these and just checking them out. So you've got Following, Memento, Insomnia, Batman Begins, The Prestige, The Dark Knight, Inception, The Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, Dunkirk, and Tenet. So, I mean, just look at that. I mean, the amount of incredible films that are on there. I mean, there's not even one bad movie really on there. There, there just isn't. I mean, if you've seen all of those, I would say the weakest one, in my opinion, was Dunkirk. I know a lot of people really liked Dunkirk, but I actually was not a huge fan. I feel like it could have really done well with an R rating, like going a little bit more um, graphic, which is what most war movies do. So I thought that Dunkirk, in my opinion, was probably one of the weakest movies on, on this list. Um, but that being said, I absolutely love these movies. So if we, if we even just look at, and we look, we think about the accolades, we think about, you know, the, the movies that he's been nominated for or have been nominated for different things. You look at, okay, so we got Tenet coming out in 2020, which is basically going to continue essentially what he's been really working on here. I mean, we, and we can look at this as to, you know, from basically 2014 to now, he's come out with a movie every three years. So every three years he's been working on something or he's been probably, you know, he, he transitions after, you know, making a movie and then he, you know, he kind of gets right back to work on making the next thing. And we look at Dunkirk, Interstellar, Dark Knight Rises and Inception you look at those four right there. I mean, Interstellar, Interstellar as well as Inception are two of like some of the most talked about movies in recent memory. And Dunkirk people still, you know, like I said, really enjoy that. The Dark Knight Rises I thought was like very well done. I actually liked it more than The Dark Knight, even though I know The Dark Knight was the most popular because of Heath Ledger's Joker, which without any question, he did an incredible job. But I thought that that was a very good movie. Uh, the Dark Knight Rises as well as The Dark Knight. The Prestige, what a great, uh, you know, just different type of movie. And I thought that was very well done. Batman Begins, of course, kind of started everything, which... I still, you know, blame Warner Brothers for not, uh, you know, continuing what Nolan had started with the Batman movies, and that really, that really bothered me that they didn't, you know, that they didn't continue what he started with the Bat after those Batman movies because they had it really laid out on a silver platter. They could have really competed with with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I personally think, if they would have, like, continued what Nolan had started. But they, uh, of course, went a different direction. But uh, that being said, you have Insomnia, which Insomnia I thought was really good. Uh, Memento, same kind of thing, and, and following. I mean, his first few movies I just thought were, were very well done. He did a really good job on all of these movies. You can just tell he's not one of those directors like a Steven Spielberg that's going to come out with a movie, like tons and tons of movies over the course of his career. But the movies that he comes out with are all movies that are memorable. All movies that you're like, yeah, that was really good. Or that got nominated for a lot of stuff. Or that was the first movie that he, you know, won X amounts of awards for. Um, or it was so uh, psychological. It was a significant thriller. All of his movies are going to be talked about for years and years to come. And that's why I think that he may not be the GOAT as of, you know, the greatest director ever, but he's making a case that he's the best director right now uh, in in the world, like absolutely making some of the, the best movies and most talked about movies and just exciting movies that people like talk about. And so, like I said, I, I, I don't think that he is, you know, one of, uh, I believe he's definitely like one of the greatest directors ever. But of course, when you look at guys like, you know, Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, um, and, and uh, you know, a number of other guys, right? I'm just kind of thinking of people who are, you know, directing right as of right now. Scorsese and, and, you know, Spielberg are certainly two of those guys who are up there. James Cameron, of course, is a great director as well, even though he hasn't come out with anything in, in a while. I, those are guys who are, you know, the, the the Mount Rushmore of of v directing in filmmaking. Christopher Nolan is getting close to that point, 
And I think that if he has a few more movies that are just as popular and just as exciting and memorable as like Interstellar and Inception, uh, we really could be seeing the next, the next guy, the next greatest director of all time. And that's exciting. That really is. But I do think he is making a case, guys. What do you guys think? As far as what he's done so far, you have Tenet that's coming out in 2020, which we'll have to kind of wait and see for. But what do you guys think? Do you think he's making a real case for the greatest director currently? What do you think about him in the grand scope of things, greatest director of all time? Where do you think he lies as far as that's concerned? Let me know what you guys think about that. So Fred, guys, a uh, a guy in which a YouTuber that uh, was really took the YouTube landscape by storm and really created some hilarious and great videos over the course of time on on his YouTube channel. Well, all of a sudden he you know he left the scene and now we want to talk about you know kind of what happened to Fred. This was a YouTuber who I used to watch was a lot of fun to watch was very, you know, very entertaining to many people. But what happened to Fred and what might he be doing, you know, at this point in time? So let's talk about it. So uh, here's what Lucas Cruikshank is doing now. So Lewis Cruikshank created the character of hyperactive kid Fred and became a YouTube sub sensation. But what has he done since retiring from the role? What happened to Fred creator Lucas Cruikshank, the character of Fred Figglehorn, is a hyperactive six-year-old boy with a squeaky, high-pitched voice reminisce of Alvin and the Chipmunks, who first appeared in a video created by Lucas Cruikshank and his cousins. The first Fred video appeared in 2006 when Cruikshank was just 13, and the character, character quickly became a viral hit. He eventually created his own channel, which became the first YouTube channel to receive over 1 million subscribers. While many found the character of Fred to be a screeching irritant, the huge success of Lucas Cruikshank's channel couldn't be denied. While the content of the channel was popular with children, the backstory of Fred himself is surprisingly dark. He lives with a drug-addicted and alcoholic mother, and his father, who he's never met, is on death row. Fred the Movie arrived in 2010, which featured an appearance by John Cena as Fred's imaginary father. Fred's character was toned down slightly for the movie, which still received terrible reviews. It was followed by two TV sequels, Fred 2, A Night of the Living Fred, and Fred 3, Camp Fred, with Cena returning for cameos in both. So, uh, before we move on here, uh, obviously there were some Fred movies that came out. I mean, this was a big character. Now, the thing about it was it was just really like when he stopped uploading on his YouTube channel, it was really unfortunate in my opinion, just because I thought that Fred was such a, had such a really, uh, had its place on YouTube. And I thought that was really great for kids, but it also, I just feel like he could have always just kind of just changed or, you know, kind of evolved the channel over time, which is everyone on YouTube has evolved their channel in one way or another over time. And I think that he could have easily just uh, done exactly that. So, the character also appeared in Nickelodeon series Fred the Show, which featured Titans co-star Ryan Potter as the title character's best friend, Brian. The show only lasted for one season, and perhaps sensing the gag was wearing thin, Lucas Cruikshank retired from the role. The Fred channel continued to be one of the most subscribed on YouTube, so in 2014, an attempt was made to rebrand it. New videos featuring content aimed at kids was uploaded without the character of Fred himself actually appearing, but after this strange experiment failed, the channel was abandoned in 2015. The popularity of Fred has been overtaken by other YouTubers in recent years, though the old channel, old channel continues to pool in viewers. Lucas Cruikshank has reprised Fred for occasional skits since retiring, but there are no signs of the character making a big comeback. Instead, Lucas Cruikshank has launched his own YouTube channel, Lucas, which currently has over 3 million subscribers. While many found the character of Fred to be understandably very irritating, it was still an impressive feat on Lucas Cruikshank's part to turn a silly comic character into a full-blown franchise. He got three movies and a TV series out of it, in addition to guest appearances on The Monsters vs. Alien Show and iCarly. 
and realized when the time was right to gracefully bow out. While he's not as visible anymore, he still has a successful solo channel and a large fan base. So, essentially, guys, he made his own channel called Lucas. Um, and I know that that was kind of, you know, his way, I guess you could say, as to uh, changing, you know, things where, you know, Fred, that kind of, that whole thing kind of, you know, uh, wore down almost on him, even though I thought that he was kind of a sig- a significant face on YouTube to an extent, to the extent where, I mean, this guy got three movies. I mean, he was like the first guy who made himself and his brand an actual franchise. And that was absolutely incredible. I, I you know, got to give in- insane amounts of props for that because that is an absolutely, that's a daunting task. And I mean, it's obviously not what he was planning on doing at first, but it ended up happening because of what he did with Fred. And I just would have loved to see the continuation of that channel. I understand making a completely new channel, kind of like his own thing. I get it, but uh, it's an unfortunate thing that Fred, that channel, ended up coming to an end. But nonetheless, I absolutely loved the channel. What did you guys think about it? And uh, have you guys been watching Lucas's new channel on uh, on his new, his new YouTube channel? What do you guys think about this? What do you think of his new channel? Would you like for Fred, that channel, to kind of continue over time? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section below. So StarCraft 3 is a game in which, guys, we've been talking about now for a, a while, right? We keep on talking about StarCraft 3, and I, I plan on continuing to talk about this game because I want it echoed into existence. I want us as a community to continue doing our part in trying to get StarCraft 3 made. And with that said, guys, you know, I, I, I made a video talking about how the developers over at Blizzard that are currently working on StarCraft 2 and kind of supporting the, the the game, they want to do a StarCraft 3. Which tells me that StarCraft 3 has been something that is being thought of. It's something that is, is in people's minds over at Activision Blizzard. Does that mean that the game is going to come out? No. It certainly doesn't mean that it, it, it won't come out. It just... It just means, guys, that it's in people's thoughts. It's kind of coming out of people's mouths. The the word StarCraft Three, the title itself, is 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 being talked about. StarCraft Three is is something that may be closer than you think, and here's why. The developers over at Blizzard want to make StarCraft Three. What's to say that StarCraft Three isn't already in development? They want to get people's ideas as to the community, like, would you guys want a StarCraft 3? And I know that we've been making, you know, lots of videos, and a lot of people now are starting to talk to Blizzard, trying to get them to make a StarCraft 3 and hopefully echo it into existence. But StarCraft 3, it really might be closer than you think because of not only people reaching out to Blizzard, but also because they may have been already been been working on this game for a number of years. They may have been working on StarCraft 3. And maybe, just maybe, it's going to get announced at 2020 BlizzCon. I wouldn't be surprised. Because the past couple of years, they really haven't had much at BlizzCon to talk about with StarCraft, just in general. StarCraft, you know, 2 going free to play was a big thing. But then the StarCraft co-op commanders, which people like, kind of helps continue the lore and the story. But a full-blown game, a StarCraft 3 would, of course, you know, it would continue the legacy. It would continue the lore of StarCraft and potentially just expand upon that, which, of course, it would. But it might be something that's being made currently. It's in development, and it's something that they, over at Blizzard, haven't really had much to talk about because they've been working on StarCraft 3. We already know, guys, that they were working on a StarCraft first-person shooter. StarCraft Ghost, which is another first-person shooter, was canceled a while back. And more recently, an untitled StarCraft first-person shooter was canceled. So they are working on StarCraft stuff. 
it's not until we hear that it's been canceled that we're hearing something. So what have we not heard about that has not been canceled yet that they're working on over at Blizzard regarding StarCraft? StarCraft 3, guys, may be in development right now. It very well could be. If it's not, we need to just continue doing our thing and telling Activision and Blizzard that we want a StarCraft 3. But we may get our wish this year at BlizzCon that a StarCraft 3 is in development and is maybe pretty far in development. I think there's a good chance of it that we may get a StarCraft 3 announced this year at BlizzCon. You also look at the difference between, uh, I shouldn't say the difference, but between StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2, you had about 10 years between the two of those. StarCraft 2 to a StarCraft 3 would be about the same now. So if it got announced this year at BlizzCon, we'd probably be looking at another year to two years before we actually got our hands on the game. StarCraft 3 may be closer than you think. But that doesn't mean that we should stop at this point with trying to tell Blizzard that we want a StarCraft 3, that we want another game in the StarCraft franchise to continue the legacy and the lore and to give us a fresh start from the bad things that kind of happened in StarCraft 2 early on uh, within the title. StarCraft 3 could revitalize and rejuvenate the real-time strategy genre as we know it. Graphically, gameplay-wise, from an esports perspective, maybe going from 1v1s to 5v5s, or it could change everything. Like how StarCraft 2 really was the first title in which kind of took esports to that next level. Maybe a StarCraft 3 could continue that, could become the next big eSport. That would be something. It could also create completely new stories for us to play. Places we've never been, to, been before in StarCraft. StarCraft could be a world bigger than that of some of these other, you know, franchises, Star Wars, Starcraft, or Star Trek. It could be bigger than some of those, but we just haven't really been able to explore as much because it's, you know, only two games that we've had up to this point. It would also guarantee us pretty much another 10 years of Starcraft until a potential Starcraft 4 if that were to ever happen. This would at least conclude the trilogy or, you know, the package deal that we've been, you know, been waiting for, but no one's been talking about it. StarCraft 3 might be closer than you think. Yeah, I said it. It might be closer than we think. Hopefully it is, but we got to keep doing our part and spreading the word to Activision Blizzard that we want a StarCraft 3. As I said in a previous video, guys, as well, that the movement's growing for StarCraft 3. People are starting to say, hey, yeah, I want this. Like, this would be cool. This would be a great idea. Let's make it happen. Get on Twitter. Message or send a tweet out to Activision Blizzard stating that you want StarCraft 3. Use the hashtag StarCraft 3. Let's really build this thing out. Let's make this thing something in which Blizzard says, we got to do this. StarCraft, may I remind everyone, that StarCraft is one of the strongest communities in all the world when it comes to gaming. Here's why. You look at streamers, you look at content creators on YouTube and on Twitch when it comes to StarCraft, and some of those guys are pooling in numbers bigger than people within the Call of Duty community or the Fortnite community or the League of Legends community. 
And here's why. The StarCraft community puts their money where their mouth is, and there is no debate about it. They support their favorite creators, their favorite streamers, regardless of, uh, you know, of, of really what's going on. I mean, they are a very passionate community. So I know for a fact that this community would be very strong even through a StarCraft 3. And if StarCraft 3 for some reason end up not being that good of a game, you still got StarCraft 2 and StarCraft 1 to always fall back on. But let's make it happen, guys. StarCraft 3, would you guys want to see it? Let me know in the comment section below. And with that being said, everyone, I hope you guys did enjoy this episode of The Ape Below Show. And if you guys did, leave a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, stay positive, and as always, I'll talk to you guys all in the next one. Peace.